Hello everyone, and welcome to War in Middle-Earth, a series where I take you through all of the major wars and conflicts throughout the history of Middle-Earth, from the First Age to the Fourth Age. In this episode, we look at the War of the Last Alliance, the greatest war of the Second Age. The conclusion of this war would herald in a new age, an age where Middle-Earth would never again see a war of such size and such scale. We left off last episode with the downfall of Numenor, the calamitous event that would see the island of Numenor sink beneath the waves. However, not all Numenorians perished in this downfall, and the most important of them were the Faithful, led by Elendil and his two sons, Isildur and Anarion. They founded the realms in exile, the kingdoms of Gondor and Arnor in 3320 of the Second Age. Elendil ruled as High King from his Arnorian capital at Anuminas, whereas Isildur and Anarion ruled Gondor jointly from their capital of Osgiliath, although both brothers founded their own city as well. Isildur founded Minas Ithil, and Anarion founded Minas Anor. Due to the population of Faithful already living in these lands, Gondor and Arnor immediately entered a prosperous period that lasted thousands of years. Okay, I am joking, that did not happen, because your boy Sauron also survived the downfall of Numenor. Returning to Mordor, Sauron found himself in an interesting position. He had achieved his goal of destroying Numenor, and had managed to corrupt many Numenorians to his side, the Black Numenorians. So that part was a massive success, but that success had come with other side effects. Now he had two rival realms, ruled by the Faithful, the Numenorians who he famously hated, right on his doorstep. And Sauron's physical death in the downfall of Numenor had robbed him of his ability to take on a fair form, so there was no longer the more diplomatic approach of honeyed words disguised as a big ball of corruption. There could now only be the method of violence. And Sauron wasn't planning on delaying. Although he'd been defeated by the Numenorians less than a century ago, his armies were still intact, and Mordor had never been invaded. He needed some time to regather his servants from the south and east, both orcs and men, including no small number of black Numenorians, and form new plans. But his goal was simple, make swift war upon the Dúnedain realms in exile and destroy them before they could properly cement their place in Middle-earth. Of Sauron's exact strength, we don't know for certain, but it can be assumed that the number was likely in the mid-hundreds of thousands, consisting of orcs, easterlings, Haradrim, and black Numenorians, as well as a small number of dwarves. We don't know where these dwarves came from, but they were there. In 3429, only 110 years after returning to Mordor, Sauron's forces struck. The Numenorians had suspected that Sauron had returned, but they weren't ready for this war. Before Gondor's forces could react, Sauron's armies managed to storm Minas Ithil and burn the White Tree of Gondor. Isildur was in Minas Ithil at the time, but he is able to escape the city along with his pregnant wife and family and a seedling from the White Tree. They sail down the Anduin and Isildur eventually reaches his father in Arnor. Meanwhile, Anarion holds Osgiliath against Sauron's armies and for a time even manages to drive them back to the mountains of Ethelduath. However, this can only be a temporary outcome for Anarion, and he knows that unless help arrives, Sauron will eventually force the Anduin and destroy Gondor. Back in Arnor, armed with Isildur's knowledge, Gilgalad and Elendil come to the conclusion that Sauron must be dealt with, lest he get too powerful and destroy the free peoples one by one. But here's the interesting thing about this. The Lord of the Ring appendices say that Sauron struck too soon, and that he had underestimated the strength of Gilgalad. So it seems that perhaps Gilgalad overestimated Sauron, whereas Sauron underestimated Gilgalad. This might actually imply that as powerful as Sauron was, perhaps the war was a foregone conclusion. And maybe that was the truth. Sauron's strike on Gondor had initial success, but that success had withered away fairly quickly. He would be able to overcome Gondor in time, but time wasn't on his side, as now the free peoples were mobilizing. This was the beginning of the Last Alliance. In 3431, Gilgalad's forces from Linden and Elendil's forces from Arnor arrived at Imladris. The size of these armies is unknown, but if I were to estimate, Gilgalad's forces, including those from Imladris, possibly numbered around 35,000. Elendil's forces from Arnor were likely smaller, as Arnor was the weaker of the two Dúnedain realms, so my numbers from Arnor are about 25,000. These two armies camped at Imladris, for three years, presumably gathering supplies, forging arms and armor, and creating their plans. Meanwhile, Gondor continued to hold firm under Anarion's leadership. 
Finally, in 3434, the Last Alliance marches forth and crosses the Misty Mountains. Sauron is aware of this, so he had previously sent some of his servants into the Misty Mountains to stir up the orcs there, hoping for them to harry the Last Alliance as they crossed. However, these orcs are dismayed by the size of Elendil and Gilgalad's forces, so they hide themselves instead. But remember them because they'll play an important role in future events. Upon crossing the mountains, the size of the Last Alliance is swelled by their other allies. They are joined by the dwarves of Khazad-dum, led by an unknown king, the elves of Lorinand, led by King Amdir, and the elves of Greenwood, led by King Orifer. These numbers are also unknown. My estimates are that the dwarves brought 10,000, the elves of Lorinand also around 10,000, whereas the elves of Greenwood brought around 15,000. The Last Alliance is also said to have consisted of birds and beasts as well, and was possibly joined by other men who lived in the Vales of Anduin. But the details of these forces are completely unknown, and once again, all we know is that they were there. As this army turns south, Sauron commits perhaps his biggest atrocity. He burns the gardens of the Entwives, located in what would later be known as the Brownlands. This is to deny the Last Alliance a safe haven on the march towards Mordor, However, with the Last Alliance drawing near to Mordor, Sauron finally has no choice but to face them. He calls off his assault upon Gondor and draws his army up on the barren plain outside Mordor, what would later be known as Dagolad. Before the Last Alliance reaches him, they are met by Anarion's forces from Gondor, taking into account that Gondor was likely the strongest of the Last Alliance realms, but had already taken losses in the war, Anarion's army possibly numbered around 40,000. This brings the size of the Last Alliance's army to around 135,000, but keep in mind these figures are my own estimates and are by no means canon. On the plain of Dagolad, the greatest battle of the war is fought. Some of the details of the battle are specified in the Unfinished Tales, but the order of these events is never confirmed. Whatever the order, the first days of the battle are disastrous for the Last Alliance. The Sylvan Elves under Orifer are good, brave warriors, but they're ill-equipped compared to the Noldor, and Orifer seems to harbour a dislike of the Noldor and resents being under Gilgalad's command. Because of this, the Sylvan Elves attack before Gilgalad gives the signal, and they are beaten back with heavy losses, including Orifer himself. And now the Sylvan Elves are led by Franduil. After this, it appears that Sauron counterattacks, and this is successful at first, as the Elves of Lorinand under Amdir are cut off from Gilgalad and driven back into the marshlands to the southwest. They also take heavy losses, and Amdir is slain, now replaced by his son, Amroth. But despite these early successes, the battle ends up going ill for Sauron. The Noldor and Numenorians are powerful warriors, and Gilgalad wielding his spear Aeglos and Elendil wielding Narsil are terrifying to their enemies. Elendil especially, because remember, he's 7 foot 11 inches or 241 centimeters tall if you're using civilized measurements, so he would have been an absolute monster on the battlefield. We're unsure of how long the battle lasted, but it was finished before the end of the year of 3434. Sauron is driven back into Mordor, and the Black Gate is breached shortly afterwards. We're not sure how, but it was. At this point, Isildur sends his second and third sons, Aratan and Kirion, to retake Minas Ithil and hold it against Sauron should he attempt to break out of Mordor to the west. Over the rest of the year, Sauron is driven right back through Mordor until he is surrounded in Barad-dûr. This is the beginning of the Siege of Barad-dûr, the second phase of the war. However, this isn't an end to the fighting. The fortress of Barad-dûr is mighty and was made with the power of the One Ring, and the Last Alliance cannot breach it. Inside, it seems that Sauron has an inexhaustible amount of manpower and supplies, and many sorties are sent out against the Last Alliance, resulting in heavy casualties on both sides. In 3440, six years into the siege, Anarion is slain whilst fighting beneath the walls of Barad-dûr, his helmet crushed by a stone from above. However, Sauron's supplies and manpower aren't inexhaustible, and in 3441, he makes his final desperate move. He himself sallies forth from Barad-dûr, with the last of his forces. The details of this final assault are unknown, but we know that Sauron eventually engages Gilgalad and Elendil in a duel, with Círdan, Elrond and Isildur as witnesses. Isildur later writes that Gilgalad was burned to death by the heat of Sauron's hand. A horrific way to go, but one cannot be a true High King of the Noldor unless you die horrifically. Elendil is also slain, his sword Narsil breaking beneath him as he falls. However, Sauron is also mortally wounded in this duel, and unlike in the films, Isildur only cuts the One Ring from Sauron's hand when he is already dying. 
With Sauron's death, Mordor's resistance rapidly comes to an end. Sauron's remaining servants are either slaughtered or driven away, and the Tower of Barad-dûr is leveled, although its foundations cannot be destroyed as they were made with the power of the One Ring. Mordor is cleared of foes, and the War of the Last Alliance is officially over. The war breaks Sauron's power. Most of the orcs are scattered or slain. As mentioned in my previous video, the power of the Black Numenorians is also broken, and the Nazgul flee far away to the east. Despite that, Sauron's evil would linger in the hearts of wicked men, especially those in Rune or Harad. It wouldn't be long before they again made war on the westlands of Middle-earth. The victory for the Last Alliance comes at a catastrophically high price. Of the six named kings that marched to war, only Isildur returned. Elendil, Gilgalad, Amdir, Orifer, and Inarion had all perished during the war. And the losses amongst the soldiers were also high. Two thirds of the Greenwood Elves were killed, as were half of the Elves of Lorinand. Arnor also takes exceedingly heavy losses, and Elendil's fledgling kingdom would never fully recover. Many of those killed are buried on the plain of Dagolad, but over time, water from the Anduin seeps in, turning the sites of these battles and burial grounds into the dead marshes. The death of Gilgalad also ends the line of the High Kings of the Nolder, and they would take a back seat in the affairs of Middle-earth, and many of them would sail into the west. Strangely enough, the kingdom that emerged the strongest from the war was the kingdom that was attacked first, Gondor. But perhaps the biggest catastrophe of the war was that the One Ring was allowed to survive. And because of that, Sauron's spirit was able to endure and eventually recover. But then again, could the One Ring have been destroyed? Could any living creature, man, elf or dwarf, stand over the crack of doom and willingly cast it into the fire? Probably not. Maybe Isildur was a fool when he took the One Ring as a Weregild for his father and brother's death, but would anyone else have done it differently? Regardless, the One Ring was now Isildur's burden, and that can only mean bad things. But that's a story for the next episode. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it, or at least found it interesting. I tried to scrounge up every last little detail I could find about this war, and that involves going through, you know, the appendices, the unfinished tales, the Silmarillion, all sorts of stuff because one book will say something, another book will say something else. It's never just all conveniently in the one place, but that's part of the fun. Uh, if you want to experience part of the wars yourself, uh, recent Lord of the Rings Online updates have allowed the player to experience parts of the Second Age. That's where most of the footage comes from. Uh, Lord of the Rings Online is completely free until August, I believe, so check it out. That really comes across like an ad, doesn't it? Anyway, next video was on the founding of Gondor and Arnor, so thank you, stay well, and remember, divide and conquer, or don't divide and get conquered.